and welcome to all of our viewers wherever you may be. My name is MK Smith. And I'm Basam Haddad. And we are so happy to be your co-host for episode 2.8 of Live with ASI, a month of knowledge production, covering the month of January. And we are very happy today to share with you a new intro that uh, we are experimenting with. And uh, here it is. We have a stellar show lined up for you today with a new uh, issue of the Arab Studies Journal, a compilation of the top 100 most read articles on Chedalia, a podcast on uh, real football, and uh, much more. And, so we can, yeah. while we... Ooh. So first off, we can talk about the Arab Studies Journal, um, which has just been released. Actually, should we intro more for the people? Let them know more of what's sure. coming? Okay, yeah. Um, so in addition to the Real Football podcast, um, discussion of pedagogy, there's a brand new Status Awada interview on gender activism and COVID-19. All of this we cannot wait to share with you. Um, must, we also have Must Read Recommendations, a partner's feature, and the return of the Grad Student Corner with Kat Heisman. And of course, engaging interviews with Brahim El Guebli, Sarah Pursley, Matt Atterbury, Makaram El Jamel, Katia El Hayek, Lena Abu Habib. As always, all content we discussed today will be included in the episode digest to be published later this week on Javalia. So sit back, relax, and let's get to it. All right, we'll jump right in with the newly published fall 2021 issue of the Arab Studies Journal. This issue features a groundbreaking interrogation of the establishment of Iraqi cinema, as well as another robust installment of the book reviews section. The issue also inaugurates a new essay or new essays uh, in a section of, of shorter pieces animated by last May's Unity Intifada in Palestine, which uh, focus on the Intifada's significance and meaning of Palestinian for Palestinians across. Sorry, we are having uh, a bit of an issue with which focuses on the Intifada's significance and meaning of the of for Palestinians across historic Palestine and its diaspora. Also featured in this issue is a much-needed special edition on the Maghrib, coordinated by guest editor Brahim El Gebli that rethinks the territorial, cultural, and human geographies of the region. In his introduction to the section, titled, Where is the Maghrib?, El Gebli provides a powerful survey of where the scholarship stands today and the importance of recognizing how Amazigh peoples, cultures, and language are not are and are not engaged in such endeavors. Are and are not. Are and are and not. Are and are not. And in just a moment, we'll have Brahim on uh, to tell us about the new issue himself. Let's, let's bring, let's bring him in. in. Yeah, Bra Brahim. <laughs> we are bringing you in as we speak. Let's get this. Uh, Hi, Brahim. Hi, Brahim. Hi, how are you? Nice to see you, Mary Kate. Nice to see you, Bassam. Nice to see you too, Brahim. Very nice to how see you. How have you been? Great, how are you? Very good, very good. We're very excited that uh, we are having you here again. Uh, we would love to learn more about uh, this project, and I know that you always have interesting and uh, exciting projects that you actually publish in Arabic and in English, and sometimes in French, on Jadali and beyond. So please let us know or give us uh, the scoop. Yeah, this is a great... Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity again to be with you here, and... Uh, this ASG issue is really uh, the result of two years of hard work. Uh, we actually started with Shireen in, to, in 20, I think in 2019, and then uh, with the editorial changes that happened in the journal, I worked with uh, Ziad and Wayne. And I just have to say that it's been an amazing journey to work with the three editors. Um, I appreciate uh, the meticulous uh, editing, the attention to detail, and the very strong peer review process that every piece, every piece included in the issue uh, has been through. So the idea for me for uh, the question of where is the Maghreb is really to interrogate space. We tend to focus sometimes on textuality, 
we tend to reference each other, but just pausing a moment and saying, well, this thing called the Maghreb, where is it? Where, where is it now? Is it in France? Is it in Spain? Is it in Italy? Is it in the United States? Is it in Canada? Is it in Sub-Saharan Africa? It's very counterintuitive as a project, but its implications are huge because then you start to think about the multi-layeredness of this place called the Maghreb in some sources, called Barbary in others, uh, distinguished uh, from Negrissi, which is of Saharan Africa in the past. And then also you get in, into the new logisms and you think about the Amazigh movement and the indigenous people of North Africa and their place, the place of their language, the, pre, the place of their thought in, in scholarship. So what I tried to do here is to bring really the project uh, when it first started was then uh, 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 however, I think the articles that made it give us a great sense of the, where the Maghreb is and uh, make great contributions to our understanding of the of this place we call the Maghreb, which also we propose to call Tamazra. And I think in putting all of this together, we have a chance to kind of like chart a new path for the inclusion of Amazigh studies into our curriculum. Because when we think about Amazigh studies in the United States, it's really a very interesting situation because you have an indigenous people called Amazigh people of North Africa who speak a language, you have a tra traditions, have a scholarly output. But when you look at our syllabi and what we teach here, it's usually within Arabic studies, Middle Eastern studies, Francophone studies, sometimes Spanish. So it, it's, it's high time that we actually started teaching Amazigh language in this country. It's high time we paid attention to the existence of Amazigh, of, of Amazigh language and culture and literary production. And it's important that scholarship, scholarship particularly pays attention to this because what's happening is that scholarship is it's much behind compared to what's happening in North Africa itself. Like uh, authoritarian regimes in the past repressed this language and culture, but no, it's recognized, it's being taught, it's everywhere. So it's high time that academic departments created jobs in Amazigh, in positions in Amazigh studies. I know that the answer would be well, resources and all of that. That's how you combat colonialism and you change, uh, because it's really interesting. Like. We might think that the way we teach and the units we have are innocent, but not. And sometimes they prolong the invisibility of Amazigh language and culture and studies and everything. So yes, it's high time that we taught this language and culture. Wonderful, thank you so much. I know I and many others can't wait to get my hands on a copy. Really? Are you, you, you I want saying, a hard are, are, physical are copy. Are you saying this or because you're the host and you're supposed no, to be I'm nice? Saying, I'm saying this because I'm, I'm, I'm going to wait until it's out. And Jed, I'm, I'm interested. You. Bennett, I'll sit on that we're call. Going to, we're going to film uh, uh, MK when the issue comes out and see if she's dying to get her hands on a copy. Cover it. Cover it. Cover it. Cover it. Cover it. Cover Sorry, but we just want to be like all real and transparent. Brahim, uh, thank, thank you so, so much, much, Habibi. This is this is really enlightening. And very quick question before we let you go: Do you think this uh, added attention that you and many others have been giving to this uh, uh, to this domain uh, about North Africa, about Amazigh studies, about the language, about the uh, contentions and the conflicts and the struggles? Do you think it's making a difference? And and where do you see it making a difference? Just briefly before we uh, move on. Absolutely. I think it's making a difference and it will make even more difference when indigenous North Africans, Amazigh scholars, Amazigh students start to talk about it more, not in terms of just recognition locally, but recognition globally and making a case for institutional changes within their departments and units to actually see Amazigh studies being offered as part of the curricula in North America and beyond. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Brahim. And we are happy to have you again. Uh, we will see you soon. Thank and you. Now, Salam. Before we move on from the Arab Studies Journal, I just want to um, throw out that in addition to the amazing entire journal, there are also new texts out now 
um, pieces that have been published, which include interviews with some of the authors of the various essays um, to kind of shed some light on what inspired them to write the pieces and their research, etc. Absolutely. Uh, next, we wanted to let everyone know that the top 100 most read articles on Jadalia in 2021 is live and can be found in the Digest. This annual list is a great way to review the most hard-hitting content produced across all of Jadalia's pages and includes both English and Arabic pieces. The list is not limited to content published in 2021 because many of those pieces have been actually uh, uh, led continuously uh, over the years and assigned in classes, which is basically the marker of the importance and shelf life of content that's published on Jadalia. The list includes pieces from uh, many various previous years that are still being read today. And As, we'll, we'll, we'll give you a snippet of this. Assistant professor and director of graduate studies at New York University, Sarah Persley, has a number of pieces that made it on the top 100 list. And in just a second, she will be with us to talk a little bit more about some common themes. Sarah, how are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? We are good and we are very excited to have you. Very excited. And we have uh, a graduate student specimen who actually has been reading your material. Indeed, I have. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, uh, Sarah, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, these uh, pieces that you have published and why do people continue to read them? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for having me um, on. And um, it's, you know, actually really cool. That's, I mean, the main article I think that's on there is just different uh, parts of it and, and um, in different languages is my uh, 2015 article on Iraq's borders. Um, Lines drawn on an empty map, I think is the, the title. Um, Iraq's, I forget, Iraq's borders and the legend of the artificial state, something like that. Um, and those part one and part two of it, and then, and then you all translated into Arabic. So the four parts there have just been showing up for the last six, seven years, however long it's been um, um, on the top 100 uh, list. I think the interest is, and the article has been influential. I mean, I, I know more than, more than anything else I've written, I'm sure. Um, you know, I get PhD students applying to work with me um, on, to work on borders, which I don't really work on. It was just this one piece that I wrote for, for you all. Um, you know, this, I think, uh, you know, one reason that it's uh, for its sort of lasting interest is um, just that this narrative that I'm criticizing, what I call the artificial state narrative, is um, so powerful and so ubiquitous. Um, you know, it's, I think it has changed a lot, uh, at least in academia, since I wrote the article in 2015. And there were other articles that came around, you know, came out around the same time that criticized it from, from different perspectives. So it wasn't just my article. Um, if you look at like, you know, our standard textbooks on the Middle East, they've changed. If you look at them from 2013 to today, you know, this artificial state narrative has been uh, rethought. And, and I think, you know, it certainly was not just my article by any means. I was building on other people, but there has been a shift. Um, you know, 2015, when I wrote the article, it was a year before the the, the 100th year anniversary of the Sykes-Picot Agreement. So people were thinking and talking about this more. Um, it was also, you know, the Islamic State was expanding in, in Syria and Iraq. And um, the Islamic State, ISIS, uh, had just released a video um, in which they bashed the Sykes-Picot um, Accord. Um, so a lot of people had been watching that and thinking about that. And so I got interested, you know, it was, again, um, just really ubiquitous in um, in public discourse, this idea that states in the Middle East, and I think especially Iraq, was really dominant in this time period, are artificial. And of course, all nation states are artificial. I mean, that's the ridiculous thing about this narrative is we have to you know, defend ourselves by saying, I know all states are artificial. Um, but the question is, you know, why is this so interesting for some states and not other states? You know, people don't think it's interesting to say the United States is an artificial state or Canada is an artificial state. So why is this so interesting um, for some states and not others is kind of what I came into this with. And where does this um, preoccupation with Iraq's artificiality come from? You know, so as a historian, I was interested both in um, looking again at the actual historical formation of Iraq's borders, which was not quite um, how it's uh, formulated in, in those dominant narratives, um, but also thinking about historicizing the narrative itself. Where does this narrative come from, this fascination with Iraq's artificiality? Um, and in the article, I trace it to a British colonial discourse in Iraq. I mean, that's where the narrative really starts, in my opinion. It was the British who were saying, we created this ridiculous state that doesn't hold together. It doesn't make any sense. We put all these ethnic and, and sectarian groups together. Therefore, we need to stay here and rule it because it's incapable of ruling itself. I mean, this was originally a colonial narrative. So I'm interested in, in tracing that back. And of course, later it becomes, you know, various kinds of nationalist narratives as well, uh, you know, Arab nationalists, for example. Um, but, it, you know, by the time I wrote 
the article in 2015, it was ubiquitous from the left to the right, you know, um, various kinds of, of nationalisms. But even in the US, from the far left to the far right, we're really preoccupied with this idea of, of Iraq's artificiality, which I link partly to the US invasion in 2003. I mean, that's when this narrative kind of reemerges in American public discourse and people get really fascinated with it. Um, you know, I think it has, uh, has a lot to do with the invasion. You know, yes, we destroyed this country, but it was kind of a fake country to begin with, right? So it doesn't really matter that we destroyed it. And this was right around when Senator Joe Biden had proposed a partition of Iraq, a soft partition of Iraq into three uh, quasi states, which which he was calling Kurdistan, which is that's legitimate because that's an actual legitimate nationalist, uh, you know, indigenous movement, but Shia Stan and Sunnistan. You know, those other two have no legitimacy whatsoever. Nobody in the region was calling for those. Um, states. So I think, you know, the article came out at a particular moment for all kinds of reasons, um, but also people were really looking for, um, you know, critiques um, of this narrative. That was a very long winded answer to your question. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, Sarah, uh, would you please let us know, uh, actually, let's, why don't we join you? Why don't we join you in the picture? Oh, yeah. Can you please let us know a little bit about the uh, what's on the horizon uh, that is um, basically uh, a, a like cumulative or a continuation of some of these uh, uh, research pieces? Well, so right now, so my, my first book came out a, a few years ago, and it was not about this. I mean, the article that, that, um, that we're talking about was kind of a little side project. It got kind of stuck in my head once I started looking at the 1920s and Iraq's actual formation. It was just for a background chapter of my first book. Um, so that was not in the first book, but it did get me interested in the question of Iraq's formation. So I am right now working on a second book um, that is going to rethink um, Iraq's formation um, in the 1920s. I mean, it actually starts in the late Ottoman period, um, looks especially at the anti-British insurgencies like 1920, but also there were earlier ones, especially in Najaf um, in uh, 1918, for example. Um, so look at these uh, anti-British um, insurgencies and then the... Um, the colonial law state that British the British established as the Iraqi mandate state. So looking at different aspects of law, um, including like personal status law, nationality law, um, possibly property law, but, and definitely the creation of the borders, that will be one, one chapter in there. So sort of um, international law, but also all the different laws that went into producing um, Iraq's borders. Um, so this is, you know, making it into uh, my second book, much more than, than it did in my first. Wonderful. And, and you're in New York right now? I am. How yes. are things in New York in terms cool. of, in terms of uh, you know, the craziness of U.S. politics, uh, COVID, uh, weather? We, you had serious weather recently. We had serious weather. It's been cold, but, you know, I like a good snowstorm. I'm from Idaho, so I was out in the parks playing with my dogs. COVID is, seems to be calming down a little bit, so uh, I'm hopeful. That's wonderful. And uh, we would actually uh, love to invite you down here to Fairfax uh, at George Mason very soon. I think I just pushed my seat down, way down. Okay, this was not planned. This was not planned. I mean, I might as well stand up because I can, you can barely see me. Uh, I'm challenged like that vertically. Okay, thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. And we would love to see you uh, soon, somehow, somewhere in New York or in Virginia. Take care. Bye. Okay. Next, we have a sort of new podcast to share titled Real Football Podcast. The reason it's titled this way is because uh, because someone would rather die than call it soccer. I would actually rather uh, be incinerated mm. than to call it soccer. What, what is this soccer thing? It's very stupid. And it's, it's been, yeah, only in America. And it's been hijacked by... Uh, the name by a sport that you play mostly with your hands and they call it football. So I know that something is coming up like the Super Bowl. We actually have a competition, me and my friends. Who doesn't know who's playing in the final Super Bowl match? You want me to spoil no, it? No, no, don't spoil it. We actually have a bet, you know, and there's a lot of money. Uh, not money, actually. Uh, it's, it's, it's pride. Right. Yeah. Co-hosted by myself and Matt Atbury, uh, the Real a real Football podcast features critical discussions on important issues within the world of football, which is a topic that is very dear to me and many others. It also connects with uh, the politics of football. In our fifth episode, which is available now, Matt and I, uh, as long, uh, as, along with several other guests, spoke uh, with, uh, with them about 
the perpetual chaos of the World Cup uh, stage and the sordid history of World Cup hosting. We also spoke about uh, Newcastle United's newfound Saudi wealth, the African Cup of Nations, and the last shot at glory for a remarkable generation of players, uh, and so on. And there's a lot of also a lot of uh, fun gossip in there. So we are asking uh, Matt to join us right now. Matt, did you disappear? Can you see me? No, we cannot see you. You were you were kind of there, but you kind of disappeared. One second. So uh, this is again the fifth uh, podcast. The first three, I think. Uh, oh, the first three were in simply audio, and then we went to video. Uh, we totally lost Matt, so perhaps we could invite him again. There he is. Okay, we do see you now. Uh, we see. We see the all right, ground. cool. Okay, flip it. All right, there we, here go. we go. Yep. Matt is right. an encyclopedic. Matt has encyclopedic knowledge of uh, football, and we actually call him the Sheikh. Matt, tell us about uh, why uh, uh, this episode was put together, and what are some of the political uh, and turbulent matters uh, dealing with the World Cup historically? Because everybody is talking about. Qatar and the problematics of Qatar and the uh, construction process and and the, and the uh, costs, the victims, and so on. Uh, but there is a history to that. Yes, the World Cup has a history that is as long and probably a little bit bloody as many uh, geopolitical conflicts. And that's one of the main things in our show that we look at is that Football and I too would rather die than call it soccer. Although I could explain to you how it got that name. Please do um, actually when you have a second. I mean, it's not hard. What they did is they called it association football and they scrambled the letters around. It's actually a British word originally. And then when America adopted it, the British uh, thumb their noses at it and said, no, we call it football. Thus people like me and you who will not use that word. I just want to say that I was on mute, but I said, ew. You asked, um, no. but yes. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not referring to, to you, I'm referring to the name. All right, tell us a little bit about some of the uh, prior cases where uh, the World Cup was held uh, at a country with a serious repressive apparatus. Uh, the the two that immediately come to mind are the 1970 edition, which was hosted by Mexico, the first one that was actually in color TV. The PRI, that was the dominant Mexican political party at the time, had spent many much of the previous two to three years killing as many college students who wanted a change to the state apparatus as possible because the PRI at that point had been in power since the 1920s as a one-party state. Uh, another example is under the military dictatorship of Jorge Videla in Argentina in 78. Uh, rumors, and we touch on these rumors very briefly on the show, are that the Peruvian government uh, agreed to let the Argentines beat them pretty badly. It was 6-0 in exchange for some political prisoners to be returned to Peru to be tortured and murdered by that military dictatorship. So dictatorship and football have a long, long sordid history. And I realize that a monarchy is a different kind of authoritarian, but it's authoritarian regime in Qatar nonetheless. I mean, we've also had it hosted by Russia just four years ago, and they're looking like they're going to invade Ukraine. But political infighting with these kinds of tournaments is pretty normal. I mean, if you go back to the first two World Cups, you had Europe and South America alternatively not want to travel to each other's continent uh, because of airfare issues related to the Great Depression. Wow. Okay. Well, you, you truly know, are a wealth of knowledge. I, I feel like I just learned so much. And and of course, you can tune in to episode five of Real Football Podcast to uh, learn more. Is there anything else you want to tell us, Matt? Maybe the next episode, which we're doing uh, in March. Uh, yes, we're going to look at domestic cup competitions, why they exist, why they're important, and why, to an extent, in this uh, cash grab mode that football is currently in, they're kind of being left behind. Absolutely, which is basically one of the dimensions of this uh, program, 
which deals with football, politics, and uh, money. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, we really appreciated the scenery behind you and the kind of, you know, um, uh, movement. Uh, if you promise to do this again, oh my God, I went down again. <laughs> this is. I love it. You know, I'm just gonna stand up. Tell us. Okay. Screw it. No chair. We uh, are at the same height. <laughs> what? We are at the same height. Yeah, it works perfectly. <laughs> That's really bad. Okay, salam alaikum. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, we'll Matt. see you soon. You, you're calling from Virginia, right? That is correct. I'm calling from my office in Chantilly. Awesome. Yalla, see you soon, Habibi. All right, see you Bye. soon. Bye. Next up, we have some news in pedagogy, or related to pedagogy. I'm going to let you fix that. This, um, this chair goes down very easily. I mean... All right. The Middle East studies... <laughs> Pedagogy Initiative. Mespi. Mespi team. The Mespi team is very excited to announce the fifth issue of the Mespi newsletter. For those who do not know, this newsletter is a resource that features interviews, updates, and on the field, pedagogic content, and much more. We won't say too much about it because yesterday, LWA producer Mohammed Abu Ghazala spoke with. Mespi Managing Editor Makaram El Jamal about what readers can find in the newsletter. Let's take a look. Absolutely. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Mohammed Abu Ghazala from the Lie with ASI team and I am so very happy to have with me today the Managing Editor of the Middle East Studies Pedagogy Initiative, Makaram El Jamal. Makaram, how are you? Good, how are you? Thanks for having me on. I'm doing great it's honestly been way too long i hope your semester is off to an okay start at least yeah you know nose in the books head down right. but i'm glad to get a chance to talk about mespi for a little bit and get out of that line instead of school oh absolutely I and mean, lie with si is always here for you to forget about school <laughs> <laughs> um really quick macadam could you tell our viewers about the mespi newsletter more generally yeah, so the newsletter does a lot of things. Its main goal is to give its readers an overview of, one, what are conversations happening within the field of Middle East studies? So we often have a staple segment of it that is just field notes. It's someone commenting on, hey, what are the trends that we're seeing? Um, as well as give an overview of what is MESPI doing, just for folks who are new to MESPI and haven't seen it. And then there are different sections for grad students or different sections for folks who are specifically interested in teaching the Middle East from being in the Middle East. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that is in the newsletter, hopefully a little something for everyone. Thank you. Um, what can we expect to find in this fifth MESPI newsletter? Yeah, so this, yeah, this most recent newsletter We've got, of course, the MESPI development section where we're highlighting all the work and contributions of MESPI to the 10 years on project, which just concluded. So you can find the essential readings that talked about the, the uprisings and reflected on the uprisings, as well as some collections from engaging books and publishers and what they had been producing about the uprisings. And then another really great section that I wanna highlight from this upcoming newsletter is the From Our Partners section where we like to feature different organizations and groups that are very important to pedagogy and knowledge production on the Middle East. And this time we've included a little feature of Hazine and they recently did a revamp of their website. So it's great new visuals and aesthetics as well as some amazing content that they've been producing both in Arabic and English on archives and writing about archives so I highly suggest folks check that out um, in addition to our little blurb about them. Yeah, thank you so much, McAdam. Um, that was really insightful. And I really do encourage everyone to check out the newsletter. It'll be in the digest, of course. As usual, McAdam herself wrote the introduction to it and it's very well written as usual. Thank you for taking time to talk to us once again, McAdam. And I really, really hope we can have you live on the show sometime soon. Yes, let's hope, you know. It'll be nice to see everyone on the show. All right. All right, next up, we have an exciting interview to share with you all. Last month, Bassem had the chance to sit down with Ala Gresh in his home in Paris for a provoking, wide-ranging discussion. And I have to say, I'm quite jealous because I would have liked to go to Paris with you. Yes. But I understand. Yes, well, uh... I have to go to school. 
etc. So we actually had a trip to Paris with the uh, other members of the Status Podcast a couple of years ago with Kylie and Noah. And we did an interview with Alain as well as a couple of other events at the Sorbonne and beyond. Uh, but there will be more because these are interlocutors that we depend on to share with us information and knowledge about uh, Europe and the Middle East, which is kind of not always in the news in a critical way. Mm. So, so Bassem, tell us about your conversation in Paris with this amazing scholar. Just to name a few uh, topics uh, that we actually addressed, uh, we talked about Europe and Middle East relations, of course, uh, French domestic politics and policies towards immigrants and Arab Muslim citizens, uh, the growing authoritarian tendencies among democracies in the global north, including uh, France and the actual case of France in terms of the increasing centralization at the level of the executive, which already exists in Paris and France uh, even before this uh, recent wave. The president in France has a lot more powers than, for instance, the United States. Uh, and actually much more so. You can tune in to the uh, interview, which uh, has uh, been widely circulated. It's also published on Orient 21, which is uh, the publication that Alain Grèche and the number of his colleagues leads in, uh, uh, in, in France. And, you know, it's kind of, it does with the, and to the Middle East, what uh, uh, Jadalia does here from uh, the United States and uh, the region. We are both, in terms of publications, uh, connected with the region in organic ways, and many of our writers actually hail from the region. Good news for all of us, though, is that you two recorded the conversation, which is available on YouTube, and a transcript is also now available on Jadalia in both English and Arabic. Now we are going to move to what we call uh, our partner feature. As we've iterated so many times before, so much of our work at ASI is thanks to the joint effort and collaboration of our partners throughout the world. Today, we wanted to highlight one of ASI's friends at the Asfari Institute for Civil Society and Citizenship at the American University of Beirut, Lina Abu Habib. Lina Abu Habib is the director of the Arab, of the Asfari Institute and is a, a sort of wizard at mainstreaming gender and development policies and practices. In just a second, we'll have uh, Lina on all the way from Beirut to talk to us about the work done between ASI and the Asfari Institute over the years. Uh, Lina, as we shared, is uh, a, a dynamic uh, a scholar and researcher and uh, I dare say activist who has uh, advanced uh, a number of causes and we are very lucky to have her and to be working with her so we will welcome her from uh, the not so uh, happy Lebanon. Ahlan Lina. Hello. Hi Lina. Uh, we, we are, yeah, we, okay. Lina is well, calling, calling from, from Lebanon. Lebanon. As we know, the electricity situation is precarious. And the and internet whatnot. situation. And yes. <laughs> right now, especially. So we are trying to go back to Lina. Here we go. Hi, Lina. So uh, as, okay, here we go. Lina, your image is perfect and you are perfect. How are you? I'm fine, but... I'm good to see you again. And hi, 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 hi MK. Hi, very nice to see you. Lena, we, we hey, want hi. to uh, hear from you about uh, what are some of the latest work that you have been doing at the Asfar Institute, including some of the collaboration that we've done together. Sure. Yeah. Lina, we can. Uh, we are not able to hear you. Um, it could very well be that we might have to uh, ask you to cut the video, if possible, so that we can hear your audio. That's unfortunate. Well, let me say a few things until we get uh, uh, Lina back. Uh, we actually have worked together over the years since 2013 uh, as the Asfari Institute uh, 
uh, actually had its birth. And we continue to do this eight years on uh, with Lena now at the helm doing uh, really fantastic work that has been exhibited recently in a short video, internal video, which I saw that actually is uh, a mark of how active and influential uh, the Institute has been under Lena's leadership. Here we go. Let's try again. Sorry, Lena, we have you again now. I hope everything is better. If you can share with us quickly before we uh, get cut off some of the activities of the Institute, including some of our collaboration together with ASI. Okay, I'm going to be very quick then. Well, of course, it was wonderful to work with you folks on the 10 Years On project, but also bringing in the perspective of emerging uh, groups, emerging uh, social movements, particularly youth, um, queer groups, feminist groups, and understand, you know, who are these groups, what are they doing, what are their strategies 10 years on after the first wave of the revolution. But I want to share with you are just two points. Um, one is we will be moving and hopefully together with ASI into looking specifically at the gendered impact of the Syrian war, of the Syrian revolution, uh, how and in which ways are uh, women, girls, and non-binary folks affected differently? What are the different strategy? What th the ways in which mobilizations, you know, uh, um, uh, local mobilizations are taking place? That's a research project that we're hoping to, that we've started developing. And also I'm very excited about working with, I, with ASI on a new volume that will look particularly on, on an issue of common interest, which is, understanding what the last 10 years have meant in terms of new movements what are the demands what does the what 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 this what does this new vibrant very diverse uh, population want in terms of a society that is inclusive a society that is actually upholds the values of gender equality that is actually very interesting, and I'm sure people, uh, I keep pointing to you as the representative of all of researchers people. and graduate students and people. <laughs> I represent the academy, thank you. <laughs> MK represents the people, because MK is a grad student at Georgetown University, and they are always looking to read the basically the latest and uh, more critical aspect of uh, knowledge production in Middle East studies. Uh, Lina, thank you so much. And I want to say that we have been in touch about uh, a lot of these projects that you addressed, including what uh, you just mentioned in terms of uh, the effect of the Syrian conflict uh, on uh, the question of gender in, in, in all of its uh, forms. And uh, we look forward to doing this with you. Is there anything else you want to share with us that Asfari, as a partner of the Arab Studies Institute, is actually doing at this point uh, be over and beyond uh, uh, our partnership? Absolutely. We are looking at what constitutes a feminist recovery. What does the future looks like uh, after the pandemic, if we can think further ahead as after the pandemic? Um, you know, what are the policies that should be uh, adopted following the, following the pandemic? How do we rebuild a world that is different for all its inhabitants? And how do we think about different economic policies? And how do we think about economic policies that nurture care and that nurture a better utilization of the limited resources of you know, that place where we live. That for us is a major challenge for the future, uh, but that is also something that we're uh, honing on. And also, if I may add uh, Bassam and MK, uh, we would really welcome young students, young scholars to work with us in different forms on these research projects. Uh, so please contact us, uh, go to our website, and contact us. Everybody is most welcome. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that information. And that's exciting news to hear for all of our different audience members, especially I know for myself as a student, that's exciting to hear. So thank you so much for joining us. We look thank forward you, to having you on again in the future to hear more about the great work that the Asfari Institute is doing. Thank you. Bye, MK. And bye, Bassam. Bye, Lina. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Well, actually, what Lina had to say 
segues perfectly into our next segment, um, which is about gender activism, Arab women, and COVID-19. In an interview for Status Alwada under that title, Gender Activism, Arab Women, and COVID-19, Jadalia Syria Page co-editor and my former professor, Katzi El Hayek, spoke with Sahar Kham- Khamis for tried to hit that letter correct. Um, from Universe Hamis. It's been a long day. Hamis <laughs> from University of Maryland College Park regarding Hamis's current research and project. The discussion focused on the gender digital gap, activism, and the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on Arab women. Welcome, Katy. Hi, MK. Hi, Bassam. I'm Hi, so Katy. How are you? Um, I'm, I'm great. I'm in Canada. Uh, and we are having a sunny day finally after Woo-hoo! a lot of Nice. Can you tell us a little bit about why you're happy that you're in Canada? Or is this private? It's long story. Very complicated. We need the whole show to <laughs> tell you the story. But, but, but you're but happy I to be... Just, yeah. I'm so happy to be in Canada. I actually was working, as MK said, um, at Georgetown last semester, and I'm currently starting a new job in in Canada, Tryerson University School of Professional uh, Communication. That's wonderful. So I, actually, that's bring me to my point that uh, last uh, semester, while I was visiting professor at Georgetown uh, Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, uh, Dr. Sahar uh, Khamis was also uh, on sabbatical leave, leave from uh, uh, University of uh, Maryland, uh, College Park, where she's uh, an associate professor, and she was visiting researcher at Georgetown Center for Contemporary Arab Studies. And uh, being uh, both of us affiliated with the center, I had the opportunity uh, to record this uh, conversation with her while I was actually very sick on that day, but I thought I had COVID, but I hadn't. Uh, I was very sick, but still, I really wanted um, uh, to chat with her and learn more about her very important uh, ongoing uh, project. So the interview, I will recommend everyone to check uh, our new status uh, issue. It has a lot uh, of great interviews and content. But uh, specifically, this interview covers uh, Dr. Sahar Khamis' ongoing uh, important uh, project, uh, which uh, she's uh, tracking uh, the changing uh, media landscape on the Arab uh, Spring, uh, uh, post-Arab Spring, uh, especially the impact of COVID and uh, post-Arab Spring uh, digital authoritarianism on journalists, especially uh, women uh, journalists, and uh, also uh, the digital, uh, the gender digital gap. So there is gender uh, digital gap between what she calls people who have access and have I don't have access to technology, but women are more even affected uh, than men in the Arabic speaking uh, uh, country. Uh, and while uh, the interview sometimes go to darker places because the situation is very challenging in the region, uh, she also emphasized that there is uh, a positive light uh, because uh, some women are using uh, digital uh, media and uh, the uh, increasing access to digital communication in the COVID era to network and mobilize more for positive social change. I I think I'm not hearing, but uh, that's uh, the gist of uh, the interview. I hope uh, you can uh, listen to it and check out also all the other important interview. And as member of Status Team, we are also uh, preparing a new issue to be released on, on March. So uh, more uh, great interviews are coming. Any chance you can give us a sneak peek of what some of those interviews might entail? Actually, I'm expecting your interview, which is a great <laughs> Thank you. Uh, about the Syrian drama and the great actress uh, Raghad Makhlouf. Uh, so that uh, hopefully will be a great interview. Actually, a lot of my students at Georgetown also produced a great interview that uh, will be featured in the next issue. One interview on the mental uh, health in Gaza. Uh, another interview, especially now we are starting the Black History Month. There is a very gr- a great uh, podcast by also another students on uh, anti-Black racism uh, in the Arabic region and how uh, 
uh, activists are also using digital uh, media and digital communication uh, to compact uh, anti-black racism in the Arab region, which is, I think, also important because uh, when we talk ab about racism in the context where the two groups are racialized others, <laughs> it became more complex and much needed uh, conversation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kati. I'm very excited uh, to see what Status has in store next. Thanks for giving us that sneak peek. And thank you so much for joining us. As always, it's a pleasure to see you. Um, and we look forward to having you on the show again in the future. Yes, uh, it was also a pleasure and take care. Bye-bye. Bye, Kati. Bye, Bye. Okay. Now let's turn. I can, I, this time, because we're both in person, I can literally turn. Let's turn to my dear friend and colleague and classmate, Kat Hasman for another grad student corner. Kat, what have you got for us today? Hi, MK. Thanks so much. I'm so happy to be here in the studio with you guys. Um, it's been a minute since I've done a grad student corner, and I hope all of your semesters are going really well. This month, I want to point you to two book reviews published on Jadulia. So first is my Serhan's review of Samia Mahrez's book, Ibrahim Nagi, A Belated Visit. Nagi was one of the Arab world's most well-known romantic poets, and his granddaughter, Mehrez, writes about the emotional and academic process of rereading his work. And the second review is Iyad Hussami's review of Andrea Duffy's book, Nomad's Land, Pastoralism, and French Environmental Policy in the 19th Century Mediterranean World. And this review actually offers an important critique that the book overlooks the voices of the colonized and ends up writing a story of the victors. It's definitely worth checking out. So I often read books and reviews before I dive into the real thing. So A, I can glean not only a synopsis of the main contributions of the book, but also the perspective of other academics in the field. And this really helps me to take on the book with a more discerning eye. And I highly recommend that you grad students out there do the same thing. And you guys can find both of these book reviews on Jadalia um, and in the digest that will be posted after this episode. And that's all I've got for you. I really recommend you check it out. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Kat. Thanks for having me. Of course. All right. Now that we have heard all about the grad student corner, um, we are going to end the show as we always do with our must read section. Um, so we have some must read recommendations. We're going to mix it up with this month. Ooh. Ooh. Let, me, <laughs> let me just restart. Let me just restart that. We are going to mix it up this month. And instead did, of. Did, did, did you notice how we seamlessly switched? You did it so. Like, it was so smooth. And I was over here <laughs> being the, not smooth. To the, no, to the point where I interrupted the show. Sorry about that. Um, I didn't know. That, anyhow. I didn't know that this camera catches me. One second. Oh, yeah, shway. Yeah, shway. Okay. Um, anyhow, we're switching it up. We're not just giving must-read recommendations. We're also sharing a must-watch. That's right. Guantanamo at 20. What we haven't learned from this debacle is a conversation hosted. Is That's not kosher, right? To, to, to just like, that's your face. Sorry about that. What we haven't learned uh, from this debacle is a conversation hosted by UCSB Center for Middle East Studies with Lisa Hajjar. Hajar, who is also a co-editor of the uh, publication Jalia, uh, is a friend and is a fantastic scholar that we used to read as we were getting our PhDs, or some of us at least, and we were lucky that she's working with us. Uh, much love to Lisa, uh, who is a very unique uh, human being and loved by all. Okay, is that too much? I, it, it was authentic. I liked it. It was sincere. Um, it was sincere. Yeah. Now, in this um, in in this conversation, uh, Lisa holds an engaging discussion. Okay. I just took. I just took. Mind? You were talking for too long, okay, so I'm fine. switching it up. Um, Lisa, Lisa, also, Lisa also enjoys swimming and reading and not watching. Go ahead, go ahead. Lisa holds an engaging discussion, complete with exclusive visual aids, about the 9-11 case in Guantanamo military commissions in which five detainees are being prosecuted for their alleged roles in the 9-11 attacks. You can find the full-length video on Jadalia and on YouTube. Marked, I'm going to take you. I'm going to take you. All right, but at least don't miss the first word. 22, 20, 20? 20, 20, 2021. You know what, you know it, I, 20, English is not my native language. 2021 marks the 10th anniversary of the peaceful, popular youth revolution in Yemen. 
as tends to happen around anniversaries, journalistic and scholarly commentaries abounded, making claims about the successes and failures of the revolution. Kemala L. Ariani and Ross Porter co-authored a piece on Jadalia this month titled Resisting Closure, Reflections on the 10th Anniversary of Revolution in Yemen, proposing that what erupted 10 years ago in Yemen continues to defy closure. Their piece beautifully describes scenes of celebration in Yemen while weaving together and, uh, and analyzing wide-ranging reflections that the revolutionary youth have shared on the, on the uh, decennial anniversary. Huh. I've never used this word. Decennial? Mohammed's making a sound far more sophisticated than yeah. we are. Thank you, Mohammed. Thanks, Mohammed. Uh, all of which uh, the author declares are, quote, part and parcel of the story of revolution itself. And that is all we have for you today. Thank you for tuning in to this recap of the Month of Knowledge production at ASI. Thank you all for joining us. As always, you can find all of the content discussed today in the episode digest, which will be published on Jadalia in the coming days. Have a wonderful February, and we will see you all in March for another month of knowledge production. Thank you all very much. I would like to also thank uh, a number of people who uh, contributed to this show in particular, including, of course, our scriptwriter Mohammed uh, Bogazala, uh, Kat uh, Haysman, who has been our grad corner. Uh, liaison and producer and host and a co-host along with Muhammad at times and our new addition to this uh, podcast Bennett Spears Bennett, why Bennett come, come here Bennett come ta, ta, ta. show your face ta. Bennett Bennett is partly Iraqi partly Syrian partly American nobody knows what here's Bennett come so this is Bennett he is working with us as the new video editor so I wanted you to be involved Thank you all for joining us. You can go now. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you all for joining us. And we are um, going to be back next uh, month with another episode. Yep. And I'm hoping that we actually made it. No. Oh, wow. That's an hour and 10 minutes. Okay, bye. Yeah.